of scares me. All right, everybody good? Yes? Everybody asleep? All right, so we're going to wrap up. I'm going to run through this relatively quickly so we can uh, go through some stuff. So this is, I was meant to be talking about from farm to table. There's some farm to table stuff in here, but I took a little bit of liberty. There's a whole bunch of stuff in this slide deck. Is everybody good with a little bit of a change in priority? So we have tractors, we have cars, we have ships. And then for those of you that have seen some of the stuff we're doing, we're hacking the brain as well. So what we're going to do is take everything that we've gone today and said, oh, crap, we've got all these problems with vehicles, and go, yeah, that's just one little issue that we have. Here's why. Actually, do I need a microphone, or can you guys hear me? Good? All right. I'm do Are you going to yell at me if I don't have a microphone? Or am I okay? I'm good. All right, sorry. So this is us. This is now. So we're good. In the past, this is the edge of the cliff that we were going towards. This is the present. We are literally over the edge of the cliff. And arguably where we are with technology, um, that's kind of where the future is. Roadrunner is not really in a good situation. So we're going to run through a couple of things. We're going to go through some of the future areas. We're going to go through the why this is logical and have some fun. Most of you already know me. I'm going to leave that up for about 30 seconds. Actually, not even that. Um, I'm kind of known for some of the avionics stuff, but we might have messed around with the ISS, Mars Rover, and a whole bunch of other things recently. And as of yesterday, I'm now at Lars, so we're having some fun there. Am I going to get yelled at? I, that's what I asked. Yeah. All right. Damn it. All right, I'm going to stand here and use this one. Otherwise, I'll try. How's that? Does that work? All right, so I'm not going to get yelled at too badly. That's your bollocks to that. I can't do that. All right, there we go. Is that okay? Good. We're using this. All right, so quick squirrel moment. I already put this up earlier. For those of you who weren't earlier, this was absolutely freaking awesome. Absolutely love it. Whoever's idea it was to come up with this, thank you. Huge hugs. Much appreciated. All right, squirrels over. Back to hacking shit. The abyss. It is arguable at this precise moment in time with everything that we've had this conversation with today, as humans, we are kind of staring into the abyss. And here's a little bit of a logical breakdown of the abyss. If you take Dante's version of the abyss, you have the nine circles of hell. So we've managed to actually map information security to the nine circles of hell. Here's some of the logic for this. As humans, we don't seem to be very good at learning through simply being told about something. As kids, we were all told, fire hurts. When the kettle is boiled, don't touch the stupid thing. You'll get burned. What did we all do as kids? Touch the stupid thing. Why? You look forward at security. We have lessons to go back on, but we haven't really done a good job of it. Here's the logic behind some of this. This is 2018 so far with reference to information security. It's not a good situation because really that was 2017. We lost, give or take a bit, almost 2 billion records. That's unique records. That's not cumulative. Cumulative is anywhere between 5 and 8 billion records. That's everything from credit cards to healthcare records to insurance information, etc., etc., etc. We are losing it almost as fast as we're making the damn stuff. And then we basically take a little bit of a recap on 2017, and we go, why are we still losing this? What is some of the logic for losing this? What is actually happening? We look at humans. We look at us, those of us that are meant to be protecting this stuff. Now, the nice thing about it is, is we can put a very nice, simple statement up, which is basically the beauty of humans for all that we are. We have a capacity to evolve. Really nice, really cool, really kind of that warm and fuzzy, hey, humans are really, really good. And then we do this. Don't breathe underwater. <laughs> Sign not in use and water on the road during rain. No shit, Sherlock. When we have to explain fundamental basics. Oh, and by the way, there's two others. Um, yeah, please don't try on the product. <laughs> Those of us that are adults in the room, this was also found. Don't hit each other with the adult toys. This is what we're faced with as humans. Oh yeah, it, uh, trust me, there's an entire set of websites dedicated to this stuff. 
So then we look at us as humans and we go, okay, give or take a bit, by 2020 comes along, there's going to be about five and a half billion of us out there connected. You start running the numbers, and in the US, there's this whole, like, you know, there's the bell curve. It's the 15% of you are getting a pay rise, 70% are getting the tap on the head, and 15% get booted out of the door. If we apply that same logic to information security and the users and people that we deal with, and again, I'll apologize, this is US-centric because that's where I'm hiding most of the time these days. You run through the stats, you run through the numbers. In the US, at best pace, the audience that we're talking with 9% of them will actually get or understand security. So now you look at the cars, the vehicles, the systems, the planes, and everything else that we've talked about, and we're trying to bash it into them and have these conversations, yet over 90% of the people in the room are going, huh, squirrels, and something else, probably figuring out what they're going to have for dinner. That is the 91st percentile that we're dealing with. You can tell I have a little bit of fun with this. Yep, exactly. And then so this is what we feel like. See, nice, simple things. And this is why, when there are websites out there that tell us exactly what passwords we want, the password architecture, the system architecture, and the most complex one that we see is one through six, or password, or passwd. This is after 25 years of trying to drill in passwords suck. And yet the most complex we still have is password one through six. It ain't pretty. It's kind of why we feel like this. Smartphones, stupid funds. And then we have to look at our industry, which goes, oh, oh, we've got bigger problems. We have to sell you something to deal with advanced persistent threats. Why? 90% of the exploits that we can do are using known vectors. RDP is still open on the internet. VNC, virtual net, it's still open on the internet. We're still able to break in using SQL injection attacks on a daily basis, and yet we've had those exploits, what, 15, 16, 17 years? Simple things, and that now translates to the vehicles that we're dealing with, the infrastructure, the architect. You heard invite, you helped to all of these guys earlier on. We're facing the same problems. So those of you that were there this morning will recognize this slide. More complex technology to an audience that doesn't understand it, integrating it into our houses, not enough people, and we don't have the eyes on the environment. That last bullet point is a huge one. You heard it at the very first talk, where it was like, we don't even know what we don't know. You heard it with the railway guys, who were like, all I really want to know is what the hell is happening in my environment. 200 computer systems in a car. Who the hell has eyes? on IDS, IPS, logging and monitoring on that stuff in a proactive way. Nobody. Big issue. So, generally, this is about where we feel. See, I'm at least half civilized. I asterisk out some of it. OK, so the baseline has been established. Let's take a look at where we're going. This is a little bit of the fun stuff. So this is not quite agriculture, but we're going to have some fun. One of the areas that we are pursuing, one of the areas that's going on is molecular and cellular biology, nanotechnology. So the ability to look at carbon molecular computer systems that we are basically starting to embed in us. You guys can read the slide as well as I can. They are amazing things at a molecular level, one of the hardest, one of the strongest, one of the best. And depending upon how you infer physics upon it, you can do all sorts of interesting stuff with these things. Why are we looking at this? Well, because we want to basically talk to Mother Nature. We take a step back and go, how good is Mother Nature doing things? Pretty damn good. We, as humans, get attacked every single day by viruses. So why not actually take the whole concept of a vaccine and apply it at a digital level, the same way we've done it in chemistry, the same way we do it in computing, and the same way that basically we've done it in the uh, healthcare world. We're looking at basically taking that whole vaccination concept, applying nano and bio nanotech to it, and deploying it back into the human, which is great until you realize that we can do the same thing too. This was 2016. Carbon nanotech architectures, EPFL's labs, teaching a carbon nanotube how to actually recognize signals, how to infer signals, how to actually recognize basic patterns. Like a kid, we started it off with language. 
2017, we taught it to swim. We also taught it to recognize chemicals. So you take a carbon tube, you apply a carbon tail, you apply laser, or you apply some other kind of electromagnetic force to it, you can now get the damn thing to move. Fast forward to 2018, this is where we are. You now have stitches with carbon architectures built into them that can now sense exactly how warm that actual area that it's trying to repair is. Why do we do that? So you don't end up with septicemia and kill people. Those of you that want to deal with the birthing side of the world, that is a turbocharged sperm. Wrap a sperm's tail in a carbon architecture, apply a frequency wave to it, and the bloody thing swims faster than Mother Nature ever wanted it to. Think of it as a turbocharger. We do the same thing with the body. We do the same thing with Wunke. You get the idea. So this is basically us looking at how we're building in carbon and bio nanotechs. Well, you can build it so we can break it. We can hack the darn stuff. That's a lot of stuff on this line. We'll leave it out there. In simple, we're going to have a little bit of fun. What we did is we took a look at something called cello. We applied a basically, as you can see, a very simple language to it, which is almost a VB assembler level script. We used a gating process architecture, and our output was a signal wave. So we took code, we gated it in electrical magnetic ways, and then we apply a signal. So now my code turns into a frequency, wireless. We apply it as a hacking tool. We take basically bird flu. You attack receptor keys to the bird flu. You attack a transport mechanism to it. You attack bipostals. If you haven't recognized this yet, we're building a Trojan for the body. With that body's Trojan, we can take, as it says, bird flu, put nanotubes attached to the bird flu. And by the way, this is being done. You can fool the body into thinking it works, because guess what? That's what a vaccine does. You put the propulsion system in, and you have a delivery mechanism. If you're nice, what you deliver is an antibody or an anti-architecture, which can hunt cancer. If you're not so nice, you attack the red blood cells. And for us, it takes about $100 worth of gear to do it, as opposed to an entire science lab. Now, if this wasn't fun enough or crazy enough, we're doing the same thing with bloody agriculture. So now you're putting nanosensors, nanosystems in, delivery systems, everything into the agriculture. So you've now just spread an entire set of attack vectors that can literally be attacked with nothing more than a $25 software-defined radio and some code you can get off of GitHub. So that's food in a nutshell. Everybody good so far? Attack the brain. So this is something I'm currently working on. This is actually a lot of fun. Um, and yes, as it says, we are going to hack the brain because, well, it's a fun. It's a brain. This is how not to hack the brain. <laughs> you cannot install a USB drive this way. You can hack the brain this way, but it's kind of a one-time use only thing. You can also hack the brain this way. This is how I started off. I don't enjoy looking like a complete dork, despite the fact to wear a kilt and funny feet. What I did start off with was one of these. It's actually a 14 unit EEG monitor. This is my brain. On the left hand side, that's my brain and some activity. On the right hand side, that's my basically brain. And what I'm doing there is I'm pulling signals out as I recognize certain objects. I actually got it down. So I've got another pair of glasses like this that have four EEG monitors on, two here and two on the other side. What I'm looking for is recognizing a computer, recognizing the phone, and recognizing the car. As it says, the phone and two other devices. One's the computer and the other one's the car. Here's the logic. We always bitch and scream about passwords. Well, why can't we, the human being, ourselves, be the simple way of authenticating our existence and our ability to actually work with the computer systems? work with the cars, work with the IoT, work with everything that we have. And that's really the logic that I'm working on, which is taking the signal, mapping the signal to recognizing it. Once I've recognized it, and I've also deployed it onto the computer or the system or the phone, it also recognizes that I'm talking with it. In other words, it's a two-way handshake with some security behind it. You now get to the stage where our existence and the very simple fact that we're relatively unique 
in who we are and how we are becomes our digital signal, again, through this noggin, to actually get in and out of systems. So far, I've got it working in the lab as I walk down the stairs, as long as I'm thinking of the computer and not playing squirrel moments, or blinking, by the way. I can unlock the car, the phone, and also the computer. And it recognizes me. And if I give it to somebody else, it doesn't work. If I'm doing other things with other people, it doesn't work. So that's one way. We talk about not just basically recognizing there are problems, but how to bloody fix it. We, our existence, should be the way of fixing it. Now, artificial bloody intelligence seems to be going through our industry like a wildfire. So let's talk about artificial intelligence for the minute. This is basically general AI, the ability to reason, to learn, communicate, represent, and to become us. When we talk about artificial intelligence, or when companies talk about they can come to you with a solution for artificial intelligence, this is kind of how I feel they are. Everybody has a solution, and let's face it, everybody's solution apparently is the best AI solution. This was RSA, well, actually last year and now this year. Everybody really decided that they had an AI solution that would fix everybody else's problem. Here's my problem with artificial intelligence. If you really want it done properly, you've got to give up on privacy. Here's the logic to that one. An actual intelligence system needs data. Machine learning relies upon data, the algorithms that we have to actually build and architect have to have that data around. Problem is, we need to feed these systems more and more data, and we need to feed them more and more data, well, let's have the conversation about it. I know, I love that one. Here's the logic. If you want a system to understand who we are, how we are, and what we are, we have to hand it everything that we are. We can't just say, you can be an AI system, and by the way, you can only learn from what I do at work, or learn from what I'm doing in the car, or learn from what I'm doing at home. That whole concept of situational awareness, that whole concept of understanding all of the variables that go into a decision that we make as a human have to also be handed over to an artificial system. So, this is us. These are humans. The influencers, what makes us part of who we are, the life. What has led me to make these decisions? And the surroundings, what are the influences on what I am doing, why I am doing it, and how I am doing it? That's what makes us, from an intelligence standpoint. This is machine learning. One subset of one aspect of one little portion of this. When somebody says they have machine learning, that's about the best that they have. We have some more explanations. If somebody's going to give you artificial intelligence, that's probably the best they're going to come up with. A boundary-based system that maybe gives various different aspects. If you want to do it properly, in our world, that's exactly what you need. The intersection of all of them. The only way you get that is you hand over all of the data. Better way of explaining it. But I have an explanation. Let's talk about regular programming. Simple. How many of you code or have coded or programmed? If you want to go from A to B, what do you program? Start at A, get your ass to B. Yes? What does the program do? It goes, ah, I'm going to head to B. End of discussion. There is regular programming. This is machine learning. I want you to go from A to B, but I'm going to give you some variables. You can go A in a bit. You can go B in a bit. I don't want you to go off the cliff. Neither do I want you to bash into the wall but you have some ability to make some reasons and some decision making. So you can bounce around a bit and you eventually end up at B. Machine learning in a nutshell. This is augmented intelligence. I want you to go to B, but you know, eventually I want you to end up at Z. And I get you to bounce around a bit until you learn and understand what those variables are, and you go straight by B and you say, thanks very much, and you head to Z. Programming. This, if you really want to do artificial intelligence, is how it should be thinking. It should start at A and first question whether B actually bloody exists, 
Secondly, decide it doesn't want to go to B, and why the hell can't B come to A? Thirdly, decide the weather's not right. It's Israel. It's too freaking hot. B can bloody well come to me. By the way, I don't want B because B smells. You want actual, true, and artificial intelligence system. That is what we have to build. The other logic for this one is a very simple one. I went around RSA, and people were talking about user behavior analytics. How many of you guys have heard of that whole... How many of you are here are dealing with user behavior analytics before I insult the hell out of it? Thank you. It's about to be insulted. <laughs> so, companies are going, wow, oh, we've got user behavior analytics backed by artificial intelligence. And I'm like, I'm going to taser you. Just hold tight. It's going to hurt. Here's the logic. An employee, your normal person that works with you, comes in 364 days of the year, 9 o'clock in the morning, leaves at 6 o'clock at night. Model employee. The 366th day of... How many days are there in a year? 65. All right, the 365th day of the year, they walk in at 2 o'clock in the morning. They download everything off the computer system and then get the hell out of there. Is that an acceptable behavior based off of, an, an basically based off of a system that says user behavior analytics? Hell no. User comes in all the other time, 2 o'clock in the morning, they download everything and get the hell out of there. The system's going to freak out. It'll probably taser them on the way out of the door. Why? Because it doesn't have the full information. What it doesn't know, at midnight, the individual had an argument with their significant other. The Alexia caught it, the home automation system caught it, everything else caught it, the body biometrics caught it. At one o'clock in the morning, because they couldn't sleep, they got in the car, drove like a lunatic to the office because they were fed up and it was the middle of the week and they had plenty of work to do and they felt sod it. Car caught it, the systems caught it, the vehicle to infrastructure caught it. Your user behavior analytics had no freaking ID. They stomped into the office. Why do we know this? Because the pedometer on their bloody shoes recorded it, but it didn't tell the user behavior system. They sat down in their chair. They downloaded everything because they were going to go home and work from home because they were like, screw it, I'm just going to get all my work done. Perfectly acceptable, perfectly happy, and you'll have an employee that's going to walk in in the following morning with all their bloody work done. How are you going to know that if you don't hand over all the data all of the time? You're not. You're screwed. So you want this system to work properly. You actually want AI. That's what you've got to hand over. Anything else is marketing bullshit. Fair comment? Good. So next time a vendor goes, oh, I've got artificial intelligence. If anybody does it in the main plenum tomorrow, let me know. I'm way more than happy to taser a few people. All right. So best case scenario. If we actually build a Sentinel system that wakes up and goes, whoa, hi, people. This is the best case, arguably, that's going to happen. It's going to look around at us, and it's going to go, well, you guys suck. You can't look after yourselves. You can't look after your fellow humans. You sure as hell can't get on with each other. You argue between each other. You throw rocks at each other. By the way, in one country, you spend all of your water on your damn lawn, and in another country, there's not enough water to actually keep humans going. Why the hell are you in the driving seat? Get in the back. Arguably, best case scenario. Unfortunately, Hollywood might actually get the worst case scenario right. All right, we've done three evolutionary paths. Fourth evolutionary path, the stumbling drunk. Here's the logic for this one. Insanity mode, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting something different. So. Up till now, we have measured how close the world is to actually data destruction or actual human destruction with this wonderful thing called the Doomsday Clock. It has been measured on simple technology as in the nuclear technology. Now, only a number of countries have got nuclear capabilities, thankfully. The problem we now have is the biggest concern is not the fact that somebody's going to drop a bomb on you, it's that somebody's going to take one of these damn things and use it against you on your planes, on your trains, on your cars, on your home systems, etc., etc., etc. So the concern is now, basically, is that now going to change from a nuclear issue to a digital issue? And if it is, what's going to happen? 
All right. How many of you are in, are in the IT security side of the world, InfoSec? I refuse to use the word CyberSec. I'm sorry. Well, what the hell does everybody else do? <laughs> All right. So I put this slide together eh, probably about a month ago, and it sucked. Not this one, but the next one. And it sucked because I realized we were right and we were wrong at the same time, and it pissed me off. I actually put it together just after RSA. We've not done a good job. Unfortunately, we've done a pretty bad job. We keep losing all the data. We sure as hell haven't looked after the very charges that we're meant to, look, to, meant to be looking after. We've created a multi-billion dollar industry that has done nothing more than sell next year's shiny blinky light in the hope of fixing last year's problems. It's not pretty. As the conversation says, we've used FUD too often. It isn't pretty, it isn't good. I'll make sure these are available. So what do we do about it? Apart from the uh, black error option. Well, let's go back to basics. We've had the conversation. Let's actually do it. We have some options. We have options with those 91% of humans. We either train them, or we take them out of the picture altogether. If we take them out of the picture, that's getting really dystopian. I'm not entirely certain I like that. There's a part of me that's like, screw it, take everybody out of the picture, we'll deal with it. There's a part of me that doesn't agree with that. But what I don't like is when we walk into companies and we're like, yes, we do end user training. And you train them once a year for one hour, not to click shit, not to send shit. And you expect them to remember it for the other 364 days. Hmm, let's see. Fail. Stop buying the blinky shit. Start spending more time on fixing the humans. Number two. Hey, we've talked about this a few times. The networks. This isn't just the networks in the enterprise. This is the networks in the cars. This is the networks in the ships, the trains, the environments, everything that we're doing. One of the conversations we had with the train guys, I'm like, you're holding a $2 billion budget. Why the hell aren't you beating the crap out of your vendors to make them give you a secure system? The same goes for you. When you have the conversation with your vendors, your suppliers, the people you're buying from, the awkward question about why the hell aren't you keeping me more secure than everybody else? I'm going to sneak behind here so you can't keep getting me one. <laughs> Simple. Remove the easy ways in. The fact we can still get onto the internet using RDP. <laughs> He's going to shoot me in a minute, I swear. Let's do this one. This is the one that still annoys the hell out of me. Everybody starts, you know, again, corporate environments, enterprise environments, government environments, it doesn't matter. You don't have a perimeter. When you start thinking you do, you failed. This is the conversation for deception technology. This is a conversation for everything else. But when you're sitting behind your firewall, IDS, IPS, DLP, and you're thinking it's protecting you, yet your car is reading your email and transmitting it to your Alexa at home, and your fridge is telling you what you need to buy because it looked at your email, and it's annoyed at the microwave, so it's not talking to it, you don't have a freaking perimeter. <laughs> And when your coffee machine knows that it's got to start at 6 o'clock in the morning because you have a meeting at work at 7 o'clock, you sure as hell don't have a perimeter. We still think in antiquated times. Guess what? The Maginot Line, yeah, didn't do too well for the French. Guess what? We don't have a freaking perimeter. The faster we realize that, the better off we're going to be. And by the way, not only do we not have a bloody perimeter, but we don't even know what the hell's going on inside our environment. How many of you work inside a corporate environment or an enterprise or a government? What the hell is it? Okay, come on, wake the hell up. What is everybody else doing? Uh, I just land around the university. Okay. So for those of you that decide you do want to participate, how many of you can accurately say how many devices you have on your network? Anybody? Is there anybody that can actually say they know how many sodding devices they have on their network? Hmm? No. So how the hell do you know how to protect if you don't know what you're protecting or what the hell you have on there? Again, back to simple freaking basics. What is it? Get the eyes on the inside of the world. Other one. 
This is a simple one as well. This is basically looking at the vendors, the suppliers, the, the third parties, all of the other people that are unfortunately leaking all of the data that we have. Simple one on this one. Get the eyes on the outside of the four walls. We can do this one to death, but we're not going to do this one to death because we all know that passwords are not happy. Phoenix is a really good friend of mine. He's sitting on a database, I think about 11 or 13 billion passwords. Chances are he probably has some of the corporate ones for people in here. Simple. Education. And then the vendor plea. It's a simple vendor plea. Start holding the vendors you have accountable. I have a hard time looking at an organization that's got a $2 billion budget out and saying you can't hold the vendor accountable. You can. And this, this I found while I was in uh, Madrid a couple of months ago. Apparently, these guys have the first anti-hacking software. If anybody would like a copy, I, uh, they downloaded, they gave me a copy. I ran it through IDA Pro, reverse engineered it, and dropped a bunch of it out on GitHub along with how to make it a not anti-hacking piece of software. <laughs> Call it revenge. All right, why? Why do we care about this? Everybody good? Is everybody good so far? Yes? All right, good. We have alcohol if we need to wake everybody up. All right, so let's have a little bit of fun. We're gonna, how are we doing time-wise? Half an hour, right, we're gonna run through some of this. Okay, everybody talks about IoT. Everybody's like, oh, IoT is this wonderful thing. You know what, IoT is a complete freaking mess, and that's just some of it. It's horrendous. And by the way, in the US at least, we have this amazing thing called FinTech. You've probably got the same over here. It's horrible, it's nasty, please taser most of the vendors. Um, 250 companies, God knows how many billions in funding. When we did our research about a year and a half ago, 65% of them had absolutely no freaking clue about security. And they're putting it on everybody's iPhones, and they're getting rid of their banks, and it's going to be a mess. You get the idea. All right. <laughs> Locomotives. You remember the conversation with railways this morning? So how many of you grew up in the math world? I grew up in, I did my, some of my math in England, some in Italy when I was at school. Do you remember that question? A train starts from point A at 50 kilometers per hour. Train B starts at point B at 70 kilometers out. Where do they meet? Who gives a damn? So this is why trains, because I had to deal with this shit at school. So we decided to get our own back on trains and attack them. We did a bunch of research over like a year and a half. And then we're like, okay, we can't use this for a variety of reasons. So we have to do it all over again. So we put a stake in the ground and said, we're going to do it over a long weekend. So we took 48 hours multiple bottles of alcohol, um, quite a lot of intelligence gathering, and about 250 foot of Cat5 cable. The Cat5 cable was actually plugged into the signal box at the end of the friend's house on a main line going into Denver, Colorado. And we did that because we needed to do research. This is what we came up with. So this is a freight yard on the intermodal system. As the trains in the US go in and out, this is freight trains, as the trains go in and out of the freight yards, they actually have an RFID tag on each side of the one. That actually goes to the manifest of what it's carrying. So if you want to actually know what the freight train's carrying, you can actually go into these damn manifests and modify it. And then when they go into the freight yard, you can actually go into the database. This was a user ID admin, password admin one, I think, to get into this database, which was on the internet. Um, it gets you in, and you can now actually, because a lot of the freight yards are automated and the train systems are automated, you can actually give it an actual pick list of exactly where you want the trains to go. So if you want to send the entire fruit, fruit juice train, instead of it going from Florida to California, you can send it to Florida to Alaska. It's kind of fun to do. Um, I'm allowed to name names because I, I still get yelled at, but it's kind of fun. So last year I was out in the UK. We uh, did a live demo hack of a train, which was a GE train. Unfortunately, it wasn't a train that was GE owned in Europe. It was actually being sold to the Chinese. Um, user ID GE password was six zeros. Telnet to the internet. Yay. Um, they also used QNX, and it was a mess. So that was geo. OK, yeah. So if any of you want to have some fun and see what the trains are doing, GE Locam will get you in there. User ID GE password GE. Really complex shit that we have going on here. So here's, you know, we had the conversation earlier. 
This is the other frustrating part. You go to GE and you go, is there anybody from GE here before I really start to just kick them harder in the nuts? <laughs> Too late. All right, so you go to GE and you go, hey, your software sucks. And they're like, no, it's perfectly fine. You're like, well, actually, no, it isn't because you're selling it to all these people and it sucks. And then you try and explain that to them and then they want all of your research, but they won't give you indemnification. So you know you're going to get your ass handed to you by the feds again. Or what happens is they're like, well, we don't care. We only sell the software to the end user. And we're like, what do you mean you don't freaking well, it's the end users deal to actually secure the software. In other words, all the tier one, tier two train systems. So you go to the tier one train guys and you go, why don't you yell at GE? And they're like, well, that'll cost us money. For fuck's sakes, get all of you together, gang up on GE and tell them you're not going to buy another bloody train until they actually fix the problem. One of those frustrations. So for any of you that want to train, what we didn't talk about earlier is they actually also run off of geofencing. So there's a company, at least in the US, and I think they have the same thing. It's called Reefer Fence. And you can actually build a geofence around the train. And if the train goes in or out of that geofence, you can tell it to do certain things. It's quite fun to do. So if the train leaves the geofence, you can get it to speed up, slow down. You can keep them in the same fence. There's some amazing things you can do with it. So anyway, there's geofence. Um, I think the user ID and password for that one were like default admin admin or something like that. Um, we talked a little bit, bit about signals. Uh, that is uh, GE's JET's local signaling system. User ID and password, you can actually pull off the internet from their manual. Thank you very much. If you plug into the switch, you can get into it fairly easily. By the way, the switch takes about 30 seconds to bypass with a set of lockpicks. Um, this in the US is called positive train control. Uh, top left hand side is the diagram. Thankfully, they put a patent out for it, so you can just pull it off the patent office, bless them. Bottom right hand side, if you are slightly squeamish and don't want to actually do your own testing on a live railway network, you can go buy one off of eBay. Uh, I think it costs us like 1300 bucks or something like that. What it basically means you can do is a man in the middle attack at basically a network level and also an application layer. So you can overflow one of the networks, get it to switch to the other one, drop a code in there, and yeah. The basically simple thing is here in English is you can basically turn all the lights green on a railway in both directions. Yeah. It took us about two and a half hours to figure that out. Um, and so yeah, obviously at that point in time, this is kind of how it ends up looking. It's not pretty, it's easy to do. And no, they haven't fixed it. All right, let's talk about food. So your other option, if you've got the 91%, you can educate them. If they don't want to be educated, then you start to affect them. So what do you do? You hack cows. How easy is it to hack cows? Really easy. It's running on Microsoft Windows XP and Windows, uh, yeah, it's Windows XP mostly. Which, if you really want to have some fun, uh, go into Showdown. And if you search for a specific string, you can actually get yourself into all sorts of milk robots. Most of the milking robots I looked at were either in Europe or, yeah, mostly were in Europe. A um, couple of ones down there. The fun thing about milk robots is as the cow comes into the milking system, it registers it on the database. And the database is the user ID and password that the distributor has put on the, on the uh, internet. And they've got a VNC backdoor, which is the same ID and password for every single company they've sold that we found. We have access to about a couple of hundred of these so far. We've got about a million and a half head of cow that we can mess around with in Europe. Um, the fun thing about this one, as it comes in, it weighs it, it does its measurements. And as it's taking the milk, it'll actually check the pH balance and other chemicals. It does that for two reasons. One, because it wants to see if the cow's healthy. And if it's not, it gives it happy, healthy drugs. And the other one is that it can actually moderate what's going into the damn milk. So if you're feeling really nice, you can give the cow extra happy, healthy drugs. And you can screw with the milk as well. If you don't fancy messing with the food supply, you can start messing with the cows themselves. I drove through Wyoming, and I had a, a full spectrum analyzer. And it kept on going off. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? Pulled over to the side of the road, nothing more than a bunch of bloody cows in the field. I'm like. This is strange. Hopped over the fence. Stopped. You can't chase cows very easily. The buggers are actually fairly deceptively fast when they want to be, especially when pursued by a man in a kilt. <laughs> when we managed to corner a cow, we realized it's got a pedometer on it. The pedometer actually has GPS tracking. 
which is absolutely fantastic. Again, the US is pretty big. They lose cows on a regular basis. Put GPS tracking on them, you can find your cow. You can also monitor how happy it is, how healthy it is, how much it's moving. The problem is the access database for these is also on the internet. So driving through Wyoming, we picked up all these cows, all these systems, and we figured out very quickly that we could get into all the databases, and we moderated the GPS coordinates and sent all the cows' GPS coordinates to a friend of mine's house in Colorado. So we were cow rustling in the digital sense. Uh, the other one down there is one of the feeding systems. Um, the FTP site for the update has no certificates on it, no code control, no source control, no nothing. So every six hours, in the middle of Idaho and a couple of other states, there's about a dozen or two dozen of those, which every six hours they stop doing what they're doing, they line dance for 30 seconds, and then they go back to what they're doing. That was about 10 lines of code that we had fun with. We dropped it in the FTP server, we watched it download, and then we giggled. So some poor farmer is looking at this damn thing on the tech support line, probably out to China, wondering why the hell the thing's line dancing. So yeah, anyway, um, yeah, that's about where we are with the food supply. And then we talk about tractor jacking. So this was the other end of food supply. We did this research four, five, six years ago, and then Jesse and I revisited it fairly recently. This is the fun stuff. So we took a look at actually crop production. In other words, if I want to really get the attention of people, I take food off the table. You take one of the basics away from people, food, water, light, communication, all that stuff. So we decided to go after the seeds. We went after the seeds because that way we can affect the actual production of crops. What we did was take a look, in this case, uh, John Deere and Ford. We took a look at both of their tractor systems. We took a look at the computer systems that they use, not just to control how the modern tractor moves, but also how it actually puts crops in the ground. When the farmer gets in to the tractor, they program in, they plug in the PTC, which obviously drops all the seeds. They program in exactly what the seed is that they're producing. It does all the variable calculations on the density of the soil, the location, and all the other stuff, and says it's going to plant the seed at, let's say, three centimeters or four centimeters deep. What we ended up doing was finding out that all of these were controlled by two SFTP servers, one out of Europe and one out of the US. If you walk into any one of the dealerships and say, hey, my system's not working, my local program's not working, they actually give you a copy of the certificate, and you're like, yay! So now we can become the SFTP server, or we can actually obviously do our own data extracts. So we dropped up to the SFTP server, dropped down the code, including all the binaries, and got into the assembler stuff and basically rebuilt their software. So on the front of the console, when the farmer says, I'm planting barley, the front of the software says, I'm going to plant it at four or five centimeters deep. Behind the scenes, what it does is the first time around it does it, it plants it shallow. So it only plants it a centimeter and a half deep. Then, as the farmers are sensible, they realize the crops come up too early, they replant. We put a second loop in the assembler code that says if it's planted or replanted inside, I think it was like X number of weeks, It'll plant it twice the depth that they've said it should plant it. So in other words, it plants it too deep. What we ended up doing, as it says, we got the cert, we uploaded it, we dropped the code in there, we signed the code, which made it even happier, and then we waited. And we tested this, and we retested it again this year, and they've still left the smiley face in there. So the general simple idea here is you affect crop production. Now, those SFTP servers control every single one of the tractors in North America, South America, and most of Europe. Hey, This is what we went after. We looked after corn, wheat, soybean, and a few others. We estimated with about six lines of code, two SFTP servers and two days' worth of work, that we could take out about a billion and a half to two billion metric tons of food production. Simple stuff. Simple code, simple work. And then if you don't want to do that, because you're a little squeamish about basically making half the planet go hungry, you can actually have some fun with tractors and combine harvesters. So they're starting to build these architectures again. The autonomy systems that are coming in, the automated systems, they're great. The harvester and the combine harvester follow each other around the field, they peel off, they do all this other stuff automatically. 
but it's a mesh-based unsecured network that if you're driving by with basically a software-defined radio, you can have all sorts of fun with it. Simple, easy things to break without anybody considering security. Do you remember we talked about shipping earlier? Those of you that were here. So, four trillion years, four trillion a year of goods. This is US centric again. I kind of apologize, I kind of don't. Um, this is basically the top 20 US ports. Obviously, the East Coast, LA, Long Beach, and there's some pretty, pretty large ones here. So, why did we go after ships? We went after ships because basically we can mess around with a couple of the architectures inside them. They used to be separated. For whatever reason, they've interconnected to the damn things. Kind of the same problem we're running into with critical infrastructure. The SCADER, the ICS environments used to be completely separate. Guess what? Now, for some god awful reason, we've connected the bloody things to the rest of the internet. And we wonder why we have so many problems. Minimal separation between the crews, minimal training. One of the instances we found, we actually reported this incident, the actual captain had run about 150 to 200 or so foot of Cat5 cable from his meant to be separate system into his cabin, plugged it into a switch to the other rest of the networking because he didn't want to be in the cabin, he didn't want to be up on the console all the time, which is great until you realize you can get into these damn things really easy. So that's the amount of ships you get to mess around, merchant ships, oil tankers, LPGs, and the UK has got vessels that they allow to carry nuclear stuff, which is quite fun. So anyway, there's ships in a nutshell. Windows 2000 server, 2003 server, you get the idea. All of that simply accessible from the internet courtesy of using the SATCOM systems. If you want to do your research, this took about two to three hours to put together. Went out onto Shodan, went out onto the internet, started to take a look at the IP schemas that all the shipping companies used, and then sent a nice little bot architecture out to basically start capturing server logins, architecture, system control setups, the whole bloody lot. It's that simple. And we're adding more complexity into it. All the IoT stuff, all the systems, the architectures, the solutions. We haven't fixed the basics, and yet I was actually out again with the Nas uh, National Guard folks, and we're like, hey, I bet we can do this, and yes, we can do. RDP into the shipping system, we're going to the maintenance system. From the maintenance system, we're going into the ballast control module. So not only can we get into the network, we can also get into the ballast control. In this case, ballast control means we can turn the ship left, turn it over, turn it right, do all those other good things. So hacked IoT, Fentech, vehicles, crops, cows, trains, ships, and everything else. Basically, um, there is actually an argument to say that you know we, the humans, need help. Therefore, an AI architecture should be good. Some final thoughts, because we are way running on time. This is one I like. Um, the measure of man is not where he stands in comfort, but where he stands at a time of challenge and controversy. There is an argument to say, at this moment in time, we are staring at the abyss. We are looking at it, and it's staring back and waving at us quite furiously because of the amount of tech that we're throwing at ourselves. Next couple of years, 20 billion devices coming online. How many of them are likely to be secure? How much stuff do we know is already out there that we're not controlling and managing? And yet we're adding more autonomy, the shipping, the transits, the trains. You've heard it all today. We have a lot of work to do. Because this actually should be the future, the ability for us to work with the technology. But for that to happen, we all have to pull in the same direction. We all have to collaborate more effectively. And that's collaborate between countries. Not just Israel or the US or Europe. Everybody's got to come together on this one way more effectively. And yes, I know this message also needs to be given to other countries. I'm working on it. Unfortunately, if we don't collaborate, this is kind of what we're facing. That is the wave of technology. And it's kind of significant. The hell of a lot of it coming down the line. So, that's the argument. As individuals, we will not succeed at this. This is why earlier on I was talking about, at least in the US, with DHS and NCCIC collaborating with them. Again, in the US, we collaborate effectively with the National Guard folks. Why? Because we need more people to help with this. So, everybody in the audience, you look around and go, how 
do I collaborate with my peers, my colleagues, the universities, the organizations, the governments much more effectively? Because we've got to solve this one way or another. Because it ain't going away. So, as always, we will close with Douglas Adams, the simple one. All right, that is me done. That, I think, is us done. Do you want to have final words? This is your beastie, your baby, your toy. I'm putting you on the spot. You're all done? All right, so you want to thank him because he's the one that dragged everybody and put everybody here together. All right, thank you very, very much, everybody. It was nice, I can put it. Have a wonderful afternoon, evening, all that good stuff. <laughs>